the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. I'm Caroline Hyde at Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, financial conditions, they tighten what the latest details in the banking crisis mean for your tech investing. We go live outside of Credit Suisse and talk First Republic stock drop. Plus, what the banking fallout means for crypto as Bitcoin tops 28,000 for the first time since June amid the turmoil. And we'll bring you the latest on job cuts in the world of technology. Amazon announces it's laying off an additional 9,000 employees. All that and so much more coming up. First, let's get the read of risk sentiment, because actually pretty muted if you're looking at the Nasdaq today, Ed. Technology had outperformed last week, a stellar week on the Nasdaq 100, up the most since November last week. So today we take a breath, we digest what's happened over the course of the weekend in terms of bank crisis and what's happening, of course, with Amazon. KBW Bank Index actually on the higher side, all apart from one key name that you're going to drill into, Ed. Two-year yield, the bonds, they surge in terms of borrowing costs. That means people are getting away from some of your haven bids. Is technology seen a some sort of haven. Move it on. What has been a haven over the last week, perhaps just tails off a little bit today, is the bid for Bitcoin. We are currently up almost 14% over the last few trading days. And today, once again, we do see, still see this 28,000 level there or thereabouts, Ed. Yeah, that momentum in the crypto space translating into equity markets. Some of the crypto-related stocks higher. Interesting, Marathon actually now lower 2.5%. It restated its financials back on Friday, opened higher, but has since given up those gains. But names like Riot higher, Bitfarms markedly higher, Coinbase kind of trading choppy as we kind of pass how long this momentum will go. Broadly, the focus is on the banking sector, right? That's where the feel good is in the equity markets. You see underperformance in mega caps. They had a really strong week last week. Tech seen as a safety play. We're unraveling that this week. Some mega cap names down considerably. Amazon down 2%. It actually paired losses on the headline, 9,000 additional layoffs, Caroline, but now continuing to trade lower. The number that always gets me is 9,000 plus 18,000 is 27 layoffs, 1,000 layoffs in total. You have to remember at the end of last year, they had 1.54 million workers yes. globally. Yes. It's a drop in the ocean. It is, but remember, most of those 1.5 million are actually contract-based. So if you're looking more at a corporate yes. job, it's what... Well, 300,000 or there or thereabouts. What's interesting is, like with Meta, a second key let round of layoffs, and like with yeah. Meta, kind of drawn out, maybe not happening till April, till May. What does that mean for the overall jobs data? What does that mean for the macro picture, not just for technology as well, Ed? Yeah, but Bloomberg's Mike McKee says exactly that. It won't show up in the data until later in the year. Look at where the cuts are. AWS, recruitment, Twitch. Yeah. Interesting there because some of those are growth areas. Some of them are consistent with what Amazon's done already. And once again, just very painful if you're in HR at any of these technology companies. And Ed, all of this, let's set it back into the macro backdrop because this is what happens when interest rates rise. This is in a cooling of an economy. This is jobs having to be sacrificed. This is also what a rising interest rate world means for banks. And that is what we've been digesting all week long. Special coverage here on Bloomberg. And we've got to bring you from a technology context because it's been a frantic weekend. You saw Credit Suisse, the takeover by rival UBS. What does this mean for the overall investment landscape? Shanali Basak, who's been working around the clock on Sunday, in fact, outside the company's New York headquarters. How does it feel? Listen, Caroline, this is really an iconic moment. This is an iconic building. I'm standing in front of Credit Suisse at 11 Madison Avenue, a building that they've been at since the 1990s, not too long ago, signing a multi-decade lease filled with people in one of the biggest investment banks in the United States. And now their cross-town rival just less than 30 blocks away the fate of this building, the people in it. There are a lot of anxieties that are under the surface. Remember, the UBS CEO in a memo just late yesterday had told his staff that this is not a done deal yet in the sense that it still needs to close, meaning they should not be sharing information yet with their rivals over at Credit Suisse, as Credit Suisse is still indeed a rival. With that said, remember, before this deal was ever announced, Caroline, Credit Suisse had a plan to cut about 9,000 jobs over time. And UBS, while they have not given 
given that sense of how deep the headcount reductions could go, there's still a plan to have about an $8 billion Swiss franc cost reduction plan annually through 2027, which implies significant job cuts. Now, on one hand, there is some silver lining here that when folks across Wall Street look at what's happening, Credit Suisse has been one of the top investment banks in the world. It presents an interesting opportunity for UBS to be getting even bigger in the United States. There are some worries as they roll off some of the more difficult assets in that investment bank. But this is really at this moment, in, in addition to a financial story, a very significant right. talent one with deep history here in the United States. Yeah, the, the, the repercussions are really being felt as well in the credit markets and the debt markets, which I'm going to get into later in the show. Bloomberg, Shanali Basak, thank you so much outside Credit Suisse in New York. Now, the turmoil in the banking sector continues, but it sparked that rally in Bitcoin and crypto related stocks. Katie Greifeld here with more. And Katie, they're talking about a high degree of correlation between basically real rates coming down and liquidity situation. What are you seeing out in the markets when it comes to crypto? Well, when you look at the rally that you're seeing in Bitcoin, crypto broadly, but led by Bitcoin, it really boils down to two theories. You have the one you were just talking about, which is that macro narrative that you're seeing big tech rebound mightily. Maybe not today, but last week was its best week of the year for the NASDAQ 100. We could be looking at the last rate hike of the Fed's tightening cycle on Wednesday. There's some talk about quantitative tightening, maybe not being long for this world. All of that would be good for Bitcoin, and that's what you're seeing in the prices. The other theory is sort of the original promise of crypto, basically that you want to be your own bank. You want to get away from the banking system. That is what some of the uh, Bitcoin maximalists on Twitter are saying right now. But you look at the performance of this asset class as a whole, some of those yeah. crypto stocks as well, it seems like it's leaning towards the macro narrative. Kara, I'm looking at CRYP Crypto on the Bloomberg. And you, f you, you forget, actually, if you look at all the other co tokens, they're all lower. They're all in the red. Bitcoin continues to climb higher. That's where the focus is right now. It's the OG. Perhaps it is, well, the safety the OG, trade yeah. when you're looking at the world of crypto. But, Katie, also what's been so interesting, we're going to dig into it in a moment, is the worry about U.S. crypto builders here in the United States being forced basically to bank outside of the United States, maybe even to move their entire company. It was notable that over the weekend, Signature Bank, which, of mm. course, had been put up, you know, taken over by regulators, was being swooped up by a common, well, a regional bank, a community lender here in New York. What are you hearing of basically resilience of the crypto market in general? Well, Caroline, that's kind of the irony is that along with that maximalist theory that these crypto companies, they need to use the banking system. I mean, you saw Silvergate, Signature, those were huge players, huge you know, instances where crypto companies connected to traditional finance. And it is interesting, if you look at some of the stocks associated with the crypto industry, I'm talking about some of the miners, for example, they're actually outperforming Bitcoin. It's really uh, striking to me that if you look at Marathon Digital, I had to check this numbers a few different times, it's up 136% this year, even though Bitcoin miners as an industry, they've really been struggling with higher energy costs, lower Bitcoin prices. That's really compressed their margins. But you're really seeing risk on across the crypto space. We'll see if it lasts. We're just dipping down by three quarters of a percent, but pretty notable that 28,000 level. Katie Greifeld, again, working throughout the weekend. I think she had more source conversations than she does on a daily basis. We thank her. Let's broaden this conversation out. Let's bring in Noelle Atchison, the founder of the newsletter Crypto is Macro Now. You have been writing on your day off over there in Spain. Noelle, what is the sentiment like? Why do you think Bitcoin's rallying to start it off? Well, Caroline, it is such a complicated question at the moment. There is so much going on. Katie totally correctly identified two of the main threads that is driving the Bitcoin performance. One is the macro story. Bitcoin is a risk asset, has often traded like a macro asset, as we know. And it is even more than that, though. It is arguably the most sensitive asset to shifts in monetary liquidity. There's also the banking crisis, and you know, Katie did mention the how that ties into the crypto thesis. I mean, Caroline, just 14 years ago, just over, Satoshi Nakamoto, the creator of Bitcoin, embedded in the very first Bitcoin blog, the a link to the headline, Chancellor on the Brink of Second Bailout of Banks. So this reminds how the macro crisis leads into the banking crisis, which leads into the crypto crisis. All of these threads are getting very intertwined, although they are separate. And we also do have the market structure 
thread going in here. Bitcoin's market structure is quite unusual, and that is one of the drivers of the speed of the rally that we've seen, up 70% so far this year. And we also have the technological evolution, which is still going on. So, so many things going on at the moment, driving the Bitcoin's performance yeah. relative to its yes. peers that you mentioned. And that is in itself unusual, because usually in an up market, Bitcoin underperforms. Ed, what's interesting, is this sort of narrative that's thriving out there that maybe Bitcoin weathers crises, chaos, at least centralized yes. ones relatively well? Well, Noel, the logic that's... seems to be you look at what's happening in the banking sector, right? If, excuse me. And, and, and then we're resetting expectations for rates globally, the Fed, the ECB. That seems to be a part of the equation here when it comes to Bitcoin in particular. And the fact that there are so many parts of this equation, Ed, you're totally right, gives Bitcoin a support, a floor, if you like, that many other risk assets don't have. When it comes to the banking crisis, it is obviously a factor and people paying closer attention to this. But very few of us believe that Bitcoin is going to replace fiat banking. Fiat banking is convenient. It will recover from the crises, perhaps in some other format. But what Bitcoin represents for many is it's an insurance asset. It's a just in case. It's a it's an ability. It represents an ability to transact even when the banking system isn't working. And I'm not suggesting it's going to stop working, but it is that yes. insurance yeah. quality that many people are paying attention to now. Noel, what is the biggest headwind to Bitcoin from this point on? Regulation, regulation, and the debanking yeah. of the crypto industry, which you referred to earlier. The debanking is a big blow to the North American crypto industry, the US, I should say, more specifically. But it's not a death blow by any means, and it's not really going to hamper much of the innovation. Much much of it's simply going to go elsewhere. This is another thing that's much overlooked about Bitcoin. It's mobile. It is so mobile. It can work just as well from anywhere in the world as it can from, say, San Francisco or New York. Um, the US will lose out on a lot of talent and also investment capital and also innovation potential, but it will eventually realize you know, the mistake that it's making and come to its senses and try to scramble to catch up. Meanwhile, Bitcoin will continue to evolve in terms of the technology, in terms of the adoption, and in terms of understanding its role in Noel, portfolios. Noel, what about, complex. though, other crypto assets other than Bitcoin? Are any of them an insurance contract too? Not as simply as Bitcoin is. Obviously, DeFi has shown that it can weather the mother of all stress tests. It has done so many times over the past few months, over the past year, arguably. DeFi, even during the very dramatic weekend we had, not this past one, but the one before with the DPEG of USDC, continued to work just fine. USDC repegged as soon as it could get access to the banking rails. So DeFi is definitely something to be looked at. But there is the regulatory overhang. Ethereum is another interesting situation. We have a big upgrade coming up. But again, regulatory uncertainty, which is why Bitcoin's outperformance in an up market is unusual right now. Normally, it's the, as you mentioned, Caroline, it's the safe and big air quotes yes. there. Safe crypto asset. It normally underperforms and others totally, you know, outshine it because they are higher volatility, but not right now because of the regulatory uncertainty. That is a headwind for the whole crypto market, including Bitcoin. And look what Bitcoin's doing anyway. Well, in simple terms, it's the regulation where there are still more questions to be answered. Noah Atchison, author of the Crypto is Macro Now newsletter coming to us from Madrid. Thank you. Now, coming up, the AI revolution continues. This time, Coca-Cola is jumping in. We'll discuss what all of that means with CFO John Murphy next as the company's partnering with OpenAI and Bain. This is Bloomberg. Coca-Cola. It is the latest big name revealing new AI tools. Today, the soft drinks giant announced Create Real Magic. It's an AI platform that lets you generate original artwork with pretty iconic Coca-Cola visual assets. Having partnered with OpenAI with Bain for this initiative, we're therefore very pleased to welcome the CFO, John Murphy, into this discussion because you really are the executive that focuses in on innovation, thinking about these sorts of ways in which it drives revenue. How does a deal like this drive revenue, John? Well, thanks. Nice to be with you, Caroline. Uh, first of all, we're at the forefront of an incredible new technology and capability. We believe it's part of our ongoing marketing agenda, the transformation of our marketing agenda. And any new, exciting engagement with our consumer base 
is, is at, the, at the core of mm. helping us create new value. In fact, our own Bloomberg intelligence analysts wrote that Coca-Cola's forecast for generating 7 to 8% organic revenue growth this year hinges in large part on achieving success with the emphasis on innovation and marketing. Just tell us how this particular AI platform is going to drive marketing in particular. What, what do you think this will bring to the forefront in terms of innovation and, well, engagement from your core audience and user base? Well, marketing and innovation is really the engine that allows us to connect with our consumer base. We are on a journey to digitizing a lot of our interactions. We love this new technology as a way to allow us to engage in a very, in a very innovative and, and exciting way. And the program we've just launched today goes through till the end of March. It's an open invitation for millions of people to co-create with us to uh, get to know the brand better and, and, and ultimately to bring awareness to the, uh, to the business and to our portfolio. So we're really, really excited with uh, learning and understanding how we can continue to build this new capability into, into the work we're doing going forward. On that note, John, Chat GPT in and of itself has raised concerns around accuracy, about some of the responses it's given. How closely are you looking at sort of deepening the integration of the underlying technology, the tool, into Coca-Cola's business more broadly with those concerns in mind? Well, I think any, any new potentially disruptive technology is going to generate its fair share of controversy. And, and it's really important to scale it within an enterprise like ours, it's really important to have good governance, good protocols, and the ability to collaborate with, uh, with the various stakeholders we have involved with this, both internally and externally. So we're, we're looking at this as a bold move uh, versus a reckless one. And we think we have in place those protocols that will allow us to incorporate it and, and advance it at scale across the company. John, is this relationship with OpenAI a marketing exercise in and of itself, or is it actually mo needle moving when it comes to what Coca-Cola is doing with technology? This is a much broader relationship than just a, a marketing campaign. We look at this as being an opportunity to really take any complex business challenge um, and compress it into a, a set of solutions that normally would take a lot longer and uh, a lot more energy and, and time to, to deliver. Clearly, it's in the early stages. We have a test, learn, and scale mindset. But we see it as being pivotal to the ongoing evolution of, of how we do business. Coca-Cola CFO and President John Murphy, thank you so much your time. Caroline. Really interesting how we talk about innovation in big business. Let's talk tech a little bit more now. C, the largest Southeast Asia's internet firm and at one point the world's best performing stock is emerging from a pretty painful 2022. In a memo to staff, billionaire founder Forrest Lee says that after months of steep job cuts, the Asian internet giant has made changes it needs to deliver profits over the long haul, marking a turning point for the company. But the CEO also warns the company still needs to prove that it can sustain a profit, writing, quote, our job is not done yet. Similarly, Indonesian ride-hailing and e-commerce provider GoTo Group just reported a narrower adjusted loss for the fourth quarter after extensive cost cuts. The adjusted loss before interest tax depreciation and amortization, that's EBITDA, shrank while revenue actually tripled, highlighting resilient demand even amid a cost of living squeeze in Southeast Asia. The company has cut 600 roles from its workforce this month, adding the 1,300 jobs it axed last year. There is a theme here, folks. Meanwhile, let's talk chips. Taiwan's exports of integrated circuit chips to China and Hong Kong falling for a fourth month in a row. That's February. As Washington Beijing tensions, they just simmer and demand for electronics continues to drop off. Exports, in fact, fell 31% from a year earlier, the worst decline since 2009. China's market share of Taiwanese IC exports plunged to the lowest level since February 2019, all according to Bloomberg Data Red. First Republic resumed trading, extended its declines to 46% in the session has been halted again. Of course, a number of ratings agencies cutting the rating on the bonds. 
in recent hours. This is Bloomberg. talking a lot about layoffs, those that are doing them, Amazon, those that are trying everything to avoid them. Just take Apple, for example, pulling every lever that it can to cut costs so that it doesn't have to lay off full-time employees. Let's bring in Mark Gurman, who has just been writing time after time about some of the areas that Apple is able to compress costs on. Yeah, thank you so much both for having me. Apple is, is unique amongst the, the biggest tech companies. I mean, as we saw today, uh, Amazon cutting another several thousand jobs. We've seen Meta do multiple rounds of layoffs, Microsoft, Google. So Apple stands out, you know, from that perspective. So how are they avoiding it? Well, first of all, you look at their cash balance. They have so much cash, right? They have so much momentum right now with the stock price. Sales are beginning to normalize. So from an outside perspective, plus an internal perspective, it would be truly horrific, right? It's horrible when other companies do layoffs, but for Apple specifically, it would be horrific given their momentum, given uh, the strategies they have in place, given the history they have in place for them to do layoffs. So what are they doing? Cutting back on travel, requiring senior vice president approval for many budget items. They're not backfilling. So as people right. are leaving in certain positions, they're not replacing them. They're not allowing cross-department transfers on the corporate side in some cases. They're not allowing cross-store transfers on the retail side in some cases. Firings are up on the retail side, not for layoff purposes, but your standard reasons about attendance and maybe lying about your hours and such. Right. So they're basically thinking of everywhere they can save money, yes. and they're doing it. A part of the story as well, Mark, we just have 30 seconds, is that actually throughout the pandemic era, they hired judiciously compared to their peers, right? They didn't do anything different during the pandemic in terms of hiring and spending uh, as they did before, right? Whereas all these other tech companies, they maybe doubled or tripled their hiring or R&D spending in some cases, and now things are normalizing, they have to pull back. So Apple stayed the course, not much has to change now. Bloomberg's Mark Gurman writing in Power On. Check it out on .com and on the terminal. Now coming up, Caro, Amazon CEO Andy Jassy mm -hmm announcing more layoffs as we've discussed. Shares had paired some declines, now markedly lower, down 2.6%. We'll continue that conversation. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. It's 9.30 a.m. here on the West Coast, but 4.30 p.m. in London. So let's take a look at where European markets close. In the equity space, the stocks Europe 600 up 1%. Volatility and meat concerns in the banking sector. We see a pullback modestly in, in the bond market. The German 10-year burned off by a single basis point, 2.1%. The concern all around Credit Suisse, UBS has come in to buy Credit Suisse. It's Swiss traded shares down 57%, 56.5% in Monday's session. UBS group up 1.5% after doing that deal with backstop on liquidity from central banks. The concern really is in the additional tier one bonds, the riskiest bank bonds where we saw a real write down risk. This is Credit Suisse's 81s. This is where the action's been throughout Monday's session. The concern is that similar effects will creep into 81s of other banks. We're seeing that play out as well. But Caroline, we have some sort of solution in the banking sector in Europe. The permanency of it is still in question. And we still look to what's happening here in the US with First Republic Bank. We still think about what it all means for interest rate setting. Of course, the Fed coming on Wednesday. And we think about what higher interest rates means for jobs too. That clear and evident in the world of technology today. Amazon laying off an additional 9,000 employees, adding to cuts that were already the largest round of layoffs in the company's history. Let's bring in Bloomberg Intelligence's Anurag Rana. Just what was interesting about Andy Jassy's own communication in the memo that Bloomberg seemed to get just ahead of the curve was the fact that they're focusing in on areas that really are growth drivers, AWS, advertising. 
Yeah, I think that was the big thing. You don't want you're they're looking at uh, non-retail units uh, where the major job cuts are. You know, for this, this indicates that uh, you know there is probably uh, still a downward pressure on growth rates in Amazon's cloud unit. Um, that has been the you know the key story for Amazon for some time. It is the biggest profit driver. In fact, last year it was the only profit driver for the company, um, and I think it you know just shows that uh, cloud consumption still remains under pressure. Anurag, in, in his statement, Andy Jassy was talking about uncertainty in the economy, the need to be lean for the rest of the year. So 9,000 additional layoffs, 27,000 in total. What Caroline and I have been discussing is that there, at the end of last year, 1.54 million workers globally, 300,000 corporate jobs. This seems like a drop in the ocean. Do you think that they would need to cut deeper later on? So the, the, fo the number you want to focus on is that 350,000 that we read at you know, Matt's piece uh, in January. Uh, those are the high paying jobs. Those are the ones that's more focused. I don't look at the other ones, the retail jobs as much. But, but, but you know, these, these numbers do matter because um, if you were to take per, per head cost for this, it's pretty high. Margins for AWS have been declining over the past two to three quarters because of age inflation, because of higher energy costs. I think this is just one way for them to get those costs back in order. Bloomberg Intelligence is Anurag Rana. Thank you for your analysis. Let's stick with the story and bring in Cara Brennan, Chief People Officer over at Latisse. Cara, it's a big headline and it's a week after Meta. What is your assessment of the level of layoffs that we're seeing right now in this technology industry? You know, as mentioned, we all know the rational thought here is that this is similar to what happened a few years ago. Technically, it, it should be perceived as a drop in the bucket compared to the total employment that we have here in Silicon Valley and, and in our tech companies overall. But man, it, it sure doesn't feel that way. Um, after the weeks that we've had recently with Silicon Valley Bank, now First Republic Bank, um, we at Lattice and our, and our 5,000 customers are having a lot of conversations about how to keep employees engaged, how to keep morale um, at a functional level while everyone's facing these challenges. Caroline, we should point out that these layoffs, this latest round, won't happen until mid-April. Mm -hmm. um, and and if there will be separation packages, of course. But morale right now, what I'm hearing at least within Meta, I'm sure in Amazon as well, is, is low. Yeah, and Meta, I'm sure now at Amazon, the feeling that it's not going to be happening overnight. You are a people-driven business at Lattice. Mm -hmm. Caro, what could be being done differently, do you think, in terms of communication? So much of this is about proactive communication as much as it is about reactive. And you saw in Jassy's memo that he's talking about trying to contain this conversation within the, conversa the context of the larger planning for the organization, trying to double down on the thoughtfulness that came with, with these um, decisions around the job cuts. What we know from being on the ground is that we have a number of organizations where people don't understand why the cuts were made where they were. Um, we know on the HR side that it makes sense to, during these times to cut recruiters, um, to cut some other administrative functions. We're hearing now, we're learning more about what's happening on the cloud side of the businesses uh, within Amazon. But that's the real question. People want to understand why are these decisions made? Why was I affected? Why was my coworker affected? And that's what our companies are asking, uh, asking for information about. How do we proactively communicate so we don't create more noise than necessary. And when you're a chief people officer of a company like Lattice, is it reality that then there's a lot of talent that you could hire up if you were in that stage? Mm -hmm. I know a lot of companies aren't. Or are people, when they're not being laid off till April, till May, when does that actually become a reality, this talent that suddenly people can get for perhaps a little cheaper than previously? On the chief people officer side, there's lots of there's definitely conversations within our networks about what will the impact of this be in the broader marketplace, and we are starting to see the impact of the um, of the layoffs that were happening in the fall, and it's probably going to be at least a quarter post layoff before we'll see these people ready to turn back into the market and look for their next jobs. We are challenged with really wonderful exit packages from a lot of these companies when you're trying to rehire these folks quickly. But I'll tell you, as a chief people's officer and someone who really cares about that side of the business, I'll take that any day. 
Cara, Lattice is a, is a people management platform, right? It also includes an element of performance review. What are you seeing in the data? What, what are you learning about how companies are going about drawing up these lists? Because they have to draw up lists, right? You know, in some cases, I've reported in Meta, for example, there have been some kind of more widespread layoffs that were done with a sledgehammer rather than a scalpel. But how do you make the decision? Well, each company is different. The, the best way to make the de decision is to be extremely thoughtful and, as you mentioned, use the scalpel. And yeah, people are coming to our platform. We're seeing usage numbers increase because the organizations that really care about driving the right outcomes for the business are organizations that are turning back into what we know are really good practices, performance management, talent reviews, uh, engagement uh, measurement from a surveying perspective. Those are all things that we provide through the platform. That being said, those are the companies that are going to weather this storm, that are going to make the right decisions if, in the worst case scenario, they have to make a decision about exits. And they're going to be on the other side yes. having made really strategic, thoughtful choices. Layoffs are never pleasant to talk about, but we are you know, learning about how these are going about. Cara Brennan of Lattice, thank you for your time. Now, coming up, we'll unpack the ongoing banking crisis and the impact on the VC landscape, especially when it comes to tech, with Kyle York, CEO of York IE, Caroline. And what has been the banking crisis impact on crypto? It has had a phenomenal run, up 25% over the course of a week or so. Today, we pull back slightly, maybe some relief after Credit Suisse being bought by UBS. We're seeing the bank stocks rise, MicroStrategy down, of course, a key crypto-related stock. Bitcoin off by eight tenths percent, but still now at 28,000 level. This is Bloomberg. Is crypto benefiting from the banking chaos? Bitcoin up 25% in five days alone for a volatile asset. It's actually only ever done that 10 times in the last five years. So why? Well, one reason is you could look to technology stocks more broadly. They're rallying the Nasdaq up over the last week. And that's as people reassess the Federal Reserve, think interest rates perhaps can't rise when you're seeing such financial instability. So you buy in to those sorts of riskier assets. Then there's the argument from the crypto faithful that this is some sort of hedge against traditional finance. Maybe if you see the failure in banks and the centralized banking system, it's all the more reason to buy into a decentralized financial system. So Bitcoin rallies. But look, those crypto faithful, they're not actually all that optimistic at the moment here in America, at least. The regulatory environment seems to be getting worse. It's harder and harder to find banking partners. And they're also seeing fines being handed out. They're seeing products being closed. They're seeing regulators taking aim at stable coins and staking. So at the moment, we're still going to have to keep a clean eye on whether this is really the time to be getting into crypto. I believe in a few months, three to six months, business will be back to normal. Uh, we, of course, encouraged our founders to leave everything but three months of money yeah, in Silicon Valley Bank, have three months worth of cash outside. So we didn't want to cause a bank run. At this point, FDIC money is safe. We're encouraging our founders to put money back in SPB. That was Vinod Kosla, founder of Kosla Ventures, on his predictions about how long we can expect the banking crisis to impact startups, Caroline. One view, but I would say an informed and experienced view, which is that it's going to take a few months to, to unravel. And we asked our audience what they thought. The answer is kind of consistent with that. Yeah, it feels that hope is there, that months, Kosla's right, 40%, but it's pretty evenly split and still have almost a quarter saying it's going to take years. This is a major impact. And this is still playing out. Look, there are many still yes. wondering about their banking relationships with First Republic, even though we've got 30 billion coming to them in terms of deposits from their own rivals. We reported on this program how quickly founders were able to diversify their banking. And in some cases, like Rippling, right, raise money in just three mm -hmm. days. On the other hand, there is nervousness there about how psychologically this is altered momentum in, in the private markets. Yeah, and we can talk about that sort of sentiment. And at the moment, we're seeing financial conditions basically tighten, get Tight. worse. We're yeah. worried about access to finance. And certainly, there's going to be a lot of worrying founders out there who just don't know where the next check is coming. No wonder we see, therefore, also the big tech companies doing layoffs like we do today. Yeah. 
Well, let's keep it going. Carl York, CEO, co-founder and managing partner of York IE, the investment firm, was out with this tweet last Friday. The business is built to help companies grow are actually failing them. That was the York take. Kyle, what did you mean by that? Listen, I think fundamentally the venture capital industry that's been around for 40 years uh, is, is, has gotten kind of almost too big to fail in and of itself, right? If you think about the mantra of nine of 10 startups fail, how is that good for the entrepreneur, the founder, the economy, if the client of a venture capital firm is their limited partners and their investors and not necessarily the companies and the people that they're backing? Caro, on the last seven days of programs, every venture capitalist that's been on the show had a different strategy, right? In Vino Costa's case, he went into his own pockets and made loans to portfolio companies out of his own funds, not the firm's funds. Everyone did it differently. Yeah, we had, of course, the Founders Fund joined us last week after many had said, well, maybe they had antagonized some of the concerns, particularly in social media, by the media finding out that they were advising their portfolio companies to pull money. Kyle, what did you do in this situation for those portfolio companies that had money in SVB? Well, listen, if you're an operator, every single day is hard. And if you have lived through the last few years of COVID and the global pandemic, and now the banking crisis that we're dealing with in technology and startups, uh, you, you really just need a warm blanket around you and you need a helping hand and you need to triage and go into triage mode. This is wartime for startups. Mm. Uh, they need to know that they have investors and they have advisors and they have people around them that can help them figure out what to do uh, during these times. Uh, thankfully, a lot of our companies that are very, very early stage, uh, a lot of them have multiple banking relationships. So whether that be their local or regional banks, uh, married with a Silicon Valley bank or a First Republic or a Chase Bank, uh, had some diversity. So it enabled them to move funds uh, thoughtfully and collaboratively uh, during the process. And you know, we just kind of warned our founders, uh, you know, even though it was a real nice ending to a movie in the Titanic when the gentlemen are playing the violin on the end of the ship, um, there really was no reward necessarily to be uh, that musician on that ship. So uh, it was just be very thoughtful and pragmatic. I think it's gonna fundamentally shift how companies manage money moving forward. What about managing business? Did you, Carl, have to think, OK, who are our winners here? Who do we choose to back, to offer support to? Or could you do it for all? Well, I think at the end of the day, the way our model works, we invest in B2B software, so recurring revenue subscription businesses. Again, we're really, really early stage. And we're always, unfortunately, needing to bucket companies into different categories. You have your high flyers. You have your stable growers. You have the ones that are struggling. Uh, you know, but at this point in time, to be honest with you, you know, it was such the throes of war, and, and, and you need to just react and sort of support everyone. On the back side of it, though, Caroline and Ed, we're definitely focused on you know what to do now, right? The funding markets over the last couple of years, you've seen valuations constrain. Yeah. Uh, you've seen the later stage markets, of course, the IPO market, public tech market come down. Uh, this is only good for B2B software because there's no denying that more and more applications are going yes. to the cloud uh, and more automation and AI is needed. But you know, how long is it going to take for it to settle? The, the market needed a correction though, right? I mean, the multiples were far too great. Uh, companies doing a million of revenue are being valued at over $100 million. That was just not sustainable. Mm. And you can't play power law that long with these startup founders. Well, Ed, I mean, the only area that people seem to feel that they do want to write checks at the moment, maybe rippling aside, is artificial intelligence, right? And I wonder if the checks get smaller or larger and as we could think about that. Ed. Yeah, I think you're just going to see valuations that are more sane, right? I mean, I think... We all know what a good company should be valued at, whether in the public markets or the private markets. And there's just been so much, so many tailwinds uh, the last several years that have made those valuations skyrocket. Uh, companies, you know, investors want to invest in good, sustainable, long-term businesses. This has always been the fundamental approach of York IE. I think you're just going to see a lot more pragmatism come to the market, which in the end, I actually think is going to be a good thing for entrepreneurs everywhere. Kyle, there were big themes and ideas for 2023 that we were discussing even as recently as the night before SVB's collapse, right, about the idea of probably fewer checks being written, the sizes of checks at the start of this year being different to what they were in 2022 and 2021. You're doing 12 to 20 deals a year, seed stage up. What is business like for you this year? What kind of transactions will you be doing and at what cadence? 
it's honestly never been better for us. Again, we are very early stage. Um, it's one nice thing to be a newer fund where we have actual capital constraints to how much capital we can deploy per year. Think about how large the largest funds in the world have gotten. Think about how large the funding rounds for those companies that they're investing in are and how big their checks need to be to deploy a billion dollars, two billion dollars. Uh, that's kind of played its way into this, into this market problem where so much capital needed to be deployed and that the valuation sensitivity and the pragmatism around the business fundamentals mattered a little less. For us, uh, we're kind of staying the course at this early stage seed stage. Um, there's more and more industries now right for disruption, uh, including banking, uh, that we're going to look at a lot of vertical applications and different things that we think have a lot of momentum out of the backs of COVID, the pandemic, digital health, banking, uh, asset management, those types of things. Kyle, great to have some time with you. Thank you, Kyle York, seemingly picking the right end of the spectrum to be on at the moment, the COO and founder and managing partner of York IE. Meanwhile, coming up, we've got to talk TikTok. The CEO is about to get grilled on the Hill later this week. This is the app is under increasing pressure, politically speaking. Here's what Kozler founder Vinod Kozler also had to say about that. I think in general, TikTok has been used for spying on US citizens. So uh, if that's true, and I don't have as much in information as the administration does, then we clearly should penalize that kind of behavior. Let's get to TikTok. The company's CEO, Sho Chu, will have to testify before the House Energy and Commerce Committee this week, bringing in Bloomberg's Kay Lines out of D.C. This is a pretty highly anticipated appearance, isn't it? It is because it's the first time he will testify in front of a congressional committee here in the U.S. This hearing is on Thursday at 10 a.m. And according to the statement from the committee, it is going to be testimony centered around TikTok's consumer privacy and data security practices, the impact on kids, as well as the relationship with the Chinese Communist Party. We know, Ed and Caroline, that this has long been the concern of U.S. lawmakers and authorities, the idea that TikTok is owned by ByteDance, a Chinese company, and that the data that it collects on tens of millions of active users here in the U.S. could be inappropriately shared with the Chinese government. Now, of course, TikTok has repeatedly said it operates independently and protects U.S. data through an alliance with Oracle. I would imagine we are going to hear that line multiple times uh, in the hearings on Thursday, but we could get a great deal of pushback from U.S. lawmakers in that regard. And who are the lawmakers listening to in this instance? We were speaking to Vinod Kozlo, who we understand is going to be having a dinner in Washington ahead of this, mm. but also are they listening to well, the young part of their constituency who really like the app? Well, yeah, there's political difficulty here, right? When younger voters who you need in order to get uh, seek and win re-election are heavily the ones that are using this app, that does make this difficult, but it does seem by and large the narrative is that national security concerns top that. And I would note that this isn't just on the part of Congress. The Biden administration is looking at this as well. Bloomberg was reporting last week that the administration is pushing ByteDance to sell TikTok or risk being banned here in the U.S. And TikTok has come back and said a divestiture would not actually solve those national security issues, that simply changing ownership doesn't uh, change the rules under which data uh, is collected and used. So this is an ongoing conversation, but yes, one that does bring great political difficulty when it comes to Gen Z and young voters. Katie Lines keeping us honest on all things happening on the Hill, of course, as we build towards that Thursday meeting. That does it. Meanwhile, for this edition of Bloomberg Technology, you do not want to miss tomorrow. Ed, we've got Kathy Wood of ARK Invest joining the show. It's going to be a key conversation across AI, across crypto, across markets, a bank crisis. Yeah, and I know that she's keen to get back to the discussion around technology. Don't forget, recap this show on our podcast. You can find it wherever you get your uh, podcast, Apple, Spotify, iHeart, and of course, on Bloomberg. Day one of a busy week, Caroline. Lots more to come. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>